My name is David Howard. I'm a member of NAWCC, that's the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors, uh, located at our museum headquarters in Columbia, Pennsylvania. I'm also a member of Chapter 154 at Daytona Beach. And today I'm going to talk about bench-made clocks going back to the beginning and then rather quickly bringing, in it, bringing us up to uh, the period of the Second World War and from the Second World War to the present. So in the very beginning of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, we had clock makers that came from England primarily who settled in Massachusetts in the late 1600s. And their trade was to make at the bench clock movements and then they would go into the community and find a carpenter to make cases for them and artists to paint their dials. They were principally making what they had made and learned to make in England which were tall clocks, which we soon called grandfather clocks. If we move into the mid-1700s, we find a family of clock makers by the name of Willard located in Grafton, Massachusetts. Grafton, Massachusetts is approximately 35 to 37 miles from downtown crossing Roxbury and downtown crossing Roxbury was not far from the port of Boston. In that family there were four sons. Benjamin was the oldest, then Simon, and along came Aaron, and finally Ephraim. The most famous of these sons was Simon Willard. Now then, Benjamin moved to downtown crossing in the period of perhaps 1775. Uh, and when he moved on from there to Lexington and other places, then Simon decided to move into downtown crossing. The clocks that they were making, these tall clocks, were fairly expensive at that time. So when you lived out in the rural part of the state, you had a limited source of people that could purchase these clocks. And so the intention was to move in closer to the Port of Boston, where there, were much, where there was a lot more money and a lot more clientele for them to uh, to uh, work their trade. So, in 1778 to 1780, Simon Willard hauled his carriage out of the barn, loaded it up with his clock uh, tools and machinery and supplies and his personal belongings. He hitched up his team of horses then of course he picked up his cell phone and he called ahead to a tavern or two along the pathway so he could get reservations for the night and a place to bed down his horses. And so we find him settling in downtown crossing uh, <clears throat> in this period. Now I would like also to say that the clockmakers of that time, such as Simon, making clocks on a bench as opposed to in a factory, they were the person whose name was on the dial and they rep that represented the man that made the movement in that period of time. And so Simon began to work there and he also had apprentices, and those apprentices 
after seven years, became journeymen. Some of them worked for him. It was a very busy time. As we turn into the 1800s, we find that in 1802, Simon gets a patent for a timepiece that will hang on the wall. His idea was to make a clock that was smaller, readily available, about one third the cost of a tall clock, and to increase his business. That clock eventually became known as the banjo clock. And his apprentices began to make them after they became journeymen. And so the whole aspect of that clock began to grow in different styles uh, and different glasses and different finials. And it created uh, a kind of wild hysteria for clocks. It was a very busy place, this downtown crossing, Roxbury. This business went on up until approximately the middle of 1840, when companies entered onto the scene to make clocks in multiple quantities. And this put an end to the bench work clock as we knew it at that time. This continued on through the 1800s, and when we got to the end of the 1800s, even more companies became involved, such as Waltham Watch, Waltham Clark Company. We had Howard and Davis in the 1850s, which became E. Howard, and they were all producing Simon Willard weight-driven banjo clocks. When we turn into the 1900s, we find a man who was born in Somerville, Massachusetts, by the name of Elmer Osborne Noe Stennis, as shown here on a copy of his birth certificate from the City Hall in Somerville. When he, during his younger years and in, in his teenage years, he obviously became interested in carpentry. And we find that when he was 20 years old, in 1931, he, we, have a, we have a photo of a desk that he made. If you go into Boston to Copley Square, and you stand on the plaza of Trinity Church, facing out across Dartmouth Street, you will see the historic Boston Public Library. The street that comes down on the right of the library is Boylston Street. And the intersection of Boylston Street with Dartmouth Street is the <coughs> Uh, final of the Boston Mas Marathon, or what I like to say, one of the Boston Massacres. If you look to the left of the public library, you find Huntington Avenue. So if you proceed out Huntington Avenue, the MBTA subway runs underneath Huntington, and as you go along, you will come to Symphony Hall, which is the home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and the Boston Pops. And if you look past them to your right, you will see the dome of the Christian Science Church headquarters. And as you continue on out Huntington Avenue, you will pass Northeastern Muni University on your left, and in a few blocks, you will come to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. You pass the front 
of the museum and in about a block and a half you come, will come to Lewis Prang Street crossing Huntington Avenue. That is actually the MBTA stop for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Now then, if you look diagonally across the street, you will see today Wentworth Institute of Technology, which is a four-year school. But in Elmer's time, it was just known as Wentworth Institute, a technical school offering various disciplines. What we find is on September 18th, remember that date, 1933, Alma Stennis entered Wentworth Institute. And on June 13th, 1934, he received a certificate in studies of carpentry and architectural design. That's one important point. Then in a enclosed in a book belonging to Alma, we found a notepad from Charles Holyoke Lumber Corporation in Charlestown, Mass. And written on the back of that by Elmer, he said, my first successful attempt in making clock cases was a hall clock made of cherry a copy of the Bagley grandfather clock located at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in 1935, unquote. Now, we know through members, through a member at NAWCC Chapter 8 in Massachusetts, his name was Harold Ironson. He was a superintendent of construction for high-rise uh, buildings in Boston. That was his profession, but he was a master craftsman building furniture and clock cases living in Westwood, Mass. I know, I knew Harold, he used to stop at my table during Clark uh, meetings and I know that he went into the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and made arrangements to go into their archives and take dimensions to make these beautiful pieces of, of uh, century-old furniture and he also was the person who made the prototype for E. Howard Company's uh, bicentennial 1976 banjo. So we know that was feasible and obviously here from Elmer's words it was feasible to him. So what this pins down for us is that Elmer studied carpentry and he studied architectural design so he knew how to take dimensions in the proper way and that's how he began to make clocks. Thus, we see this clockmaker, Elmer Stennis, was never apprenticed to anyone to learn that trade. Also, this is a distinct change from the early settlers in that Elmer, with his name on the dial, represents the person who made the cases and then had to go out again and have the dials painted. But he also had to, in that period of time, scrounge movements 
to go into his cases. Okay. In 19, that's, that was the important point I wanted to make, that he was never apprenticed, he was self-taught, and Benchmade Clarks from that point on represented Clarks makers who made the cases, not the movements. Also in 1935, he had his first marriage to Eleanor, and they had two children. Her name was Eleanor Jean Newcomb. They were married on the 17th of May, 1935 in Albany, New York. They had two sons, Elmer Osborne Jr., who they called Buster, and they had Eric Nelson, who was born 16 January, 1939 in Weymouth, and he died in 1997, January 19th in Georgia. Eleanor died in 1939, so they were only married together for four years. Uh, I was not able to discover the cause of her death. So we move along and we find that in 1937, Elma is working as a railroad policeman for the Boston and Albany Railroad. And we know that because we have his ID card which gives his name and states he's a railroad policeman. This is the New York Central System, Boston and Albany Railroad, 1937. And it was valid until December 31st, 1937. On the back, we find his signature on this card. Now, all of us know that we have quirks in our life. And one of the quirks that Alma had was when he signed his name in script, he always put a dot in the center of the O for Osborne. And we find it here on his card, and I will refer to it again later in my story where it appears. In 1938, he built his Royal Barry Wills designed house with a clock shop inside in Weymouth, Mass on 10 acres of land that he had purchased. So this is where he began to make clocks in his home. Elma, Elma, excuse me, Elma then married his second, for the second time, to Eva. I'm sorry, I don't have the date of that marriage. Her name was Eva G. Ananis. Ananis. They had two sons. Elliot was born on 6 May 1951 in Weymouth, and he now lives in California. Esther, his sister, was born on 29 May 1941 in Somerville, Mass. She died 28 December 1975, And she had the surname of Brown attached to her, and she was known to have committed suicide. So we move along. I was born in 1938 on September 18th. Five years 
after Elmer entered Wentworth Institute. And incidentally, why I know all about that area is because I too attended Wentworth Institute in 19, from 1956 to 1958. Well, what happened? One year later, on September 1st, 1939, we find Hitler's Nazi Germany moving into Poland, which historians claim is the start, have, have, have marked the start of World War II. That was 17 days before I was one year old. Now, I don't know in what period from that beginning of the war in Poland to when Elma Stennis went to work in the Quincy shipyards. Some of us would call it the Four River shipyards. And he worked in the model shop in those yards. And the reason that we know that is because this book, Knowing, Collecting, and Restoring Early American Furniture, was given to him, signed by 16 people, and stated best wishes from the model shop, 1945. So we know that he worked there until the end of World War II. We should also imagine that during the war, he worked nights and weekends in his clock shop. But he didn't begin to really work at what his life vision was, building clocks, until the end of the war. And we also know that he had been working at night. Because here we have a picture of Elma kneeling in his yard, holding two banjo clocks, the one in his right hand to your left was made to be gilded as it has the four square corners. And the one on the right was to be made we would assume as a cross-banded banjo clock. As he moved along uh, experimenting and copying cases, presumably some in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and perhaps some elsewhere, He worked into the 50s, and when he got into the 1950s, uh, the story that is told to me is that he had a man working for him that lived, sorry, that went to school with a Foster S. Stephen, spelled with a P.H. Campos in Dedham, and that Elma had a problem, and this fellow said, I know a man in Dedham who can solve your problem. Foster, at that time, was working in the furniture business in Boston with his father, where he learned how to color and finish furniture. This story was related to me by Foster Campos. He told me after a couple of projects that Stennis needed help on, this fellow came to him and said, Elmo would like you to come down so he could meet you because he wants to offer you a job. And that's exactly what happened. And Foster went to work for Elmo Stennis in Weymouth and thus began his apprenticeship in making clocks. During the 1950s and 60s, clock production 
continued to grow, and the name Alma Stennis grew with it. They produced a variety of different clocks. Once he got going, he began to make a number of different styles of clocks. And we know that from his catalogs of later date. I have one that starts in 1963. The next one is from 66 to 67. And then we have 68 and 69. And the last one I have is 72 to 73. And so if you look in these catalogs, you will see what he made. He made bracket clocks in the, in the later years. He made pillar and scrolls. He made the Girondo version of the banjo clock. He made a standard banjo and a presentation banjo. He made his own design called the Wessagusset. And he made grandmother clocks and grandfather clocks. And these clocks housed various movements. They were made sometimes to order. The glasses in his early days were painted, the reverse glasses for his banjos were painted by Marianne Picasso from Arlington, Massachusetts. And in the early days, his dials were hand painted by Edgar Senior. At the same time that he was promoting his clocks, he was promoting himself. He was very active in marketing himself, not only for the clocks, but also for personal reasons in the community that he, that he lived. He was well known by the chief of police in Weymouth, and he was also heavily involved in the Freemasons, to the point, point that he became the potentate of the Freemasons in Weymouth on September 17th, 1957. And here is his gavel with the engraved plaque that says W.O.R. period, Elma O. Stennis from the five E's, capital E's, September 17th, 1957. It also says gavel from historic Washington Elm, 1779, which is uh, known to be a, li a little bit false in all circles. In 1959, he built his big shop on the property. We have no photos, unfortunately, of that shop. Remember I said that he scrounged, he had to scrounge movements. Here is a picture of a little cabin on his property. And you see these large clocks. He was able to capture a large quantity of clocks from the MBTA in Boston when they changed their clocks. And here in front is Buster. And he's kind of well dressed up, so it was probably, and the trees don't have any, have any leaves on it, so probably late fall and cool at that time. This was a photo taken in 1954 uh, when Buster was at age three. Here also is a photo of Elma in his larger workshop. And we have many, many other photos of him as well. Now, in 
Now then, as we approach the end of the 1960s, we find Elmar in a diminishing state of mind, drinking excessively and involved with another woman. His wife, Eva, confronts him and history was headed for a change. Now, I wanted to bring this up not as an accentuation of excitement, but it will show you how history changed into the next clock maker. On December 2nd, 1968, when he was in a big argument in the kitchen of his home with Eva. And I can only suppose that he had been drinking, but I don't know. It got so heated that he left the kitchen, went down to his large workshop, opened the drawer and took out his antique over under pistol. Went back to the kitchen. And unfortunately here I have to jump ahead with what I know and then I will tell you why I, I know this. She was standing in the door case of the kitchen. He put the gun to her head. She did not stop talking. He pulled the trigger and was told to me in a disgusting way, she dropped like a, he, he told this to a person I know, that she dropped like a sack of potatoes. He went over to the telephone, set his gun down, picked up the phone, called the chief of police and said, you need to come here, I just killed my wife. That was on the 2nd of December, 1968. He was taken to the police station and a story that just became known to us a couple of months ago. His son, Elliot, was brought to the police station because it was Elliot's mother that was killed. And the story as told verbally to us by a friend of Elliot's, is that at the police station, the police did not understand how to disarm this antique revolver. And Elliot, his son, stepped up and said, I, I can take care of that for you. And Elliot disarmed the revolver. So from December 3rd, 1968, to February 15th, 1969, we find Alma first in the Dedham Jail, and then he was transferred to the Bridgewater Jail for observation. On February 15th, 1969, until September 11th, 1969, roughly seven months, we find him out on bail. As told to me uh, under, with several conversations I had with Foster Campos, he believed that this was inappropriate, that his lawyer, who was a former judge, was able to get him out on bail. And it was understood at that time in history, he was the first person in the state of Massachusetts to be able to get out on bail with a manslaughter charge. During that time, he only made liar clocks and he stamped them OOB, being the marketeer that he was, out on bail. On September 16, 1969 to October 24, 1969, we find Elmer in the Walpole Jail on trial and eventually convicted of manslaughter and given seven years in prison. 
Foster always said that that was the wrong decision. It should have been for first degree murder because he left the kitchen, went down to his shop, picked up the gun, came back and shot his wife. So on October 24th, 1969, he was sent to MCIP, that's Massachusetts Correctional Institute, Plymouth, Plymouth County, not the city of Plymouth, a low security prison located in Carver, Massachusetts. Now, there were murderers like himself there, but it was a low security prison. And during that time, Foster Campos was given power of attorney to run his property and his clock shop. And we have a copy of that power of attorney. Life in prison was a party at the expense of Massachusetts taxpayers. He took over the maintenance cottage and he brought in and installed his power tools and his hand tools. He even put the sign when one TikTok lane up on the outside of the cottage. And here we have a picture of him sitting on the stoop. It's incredible. Foster would bring in the lumber in the pickup truck and take back to Weymouth the cases for finishing, setup, and selling. It was such a low security prison at that time that the guards just waved Foster through the gates. While in prison, Elma made, using the help of other inmates, over 800 clock cases and parts for cases. In 1970 and 1972, they made 92 liar clocks. In 1972, December of 1972, they made 16 diamond head cases that were not stamped for serial number or date. We have that information in another small book of Elmer's which has all kinds of information about whom he sent Christmas cards to, as well as more significant information of what took place while he was in prison. It also tells us what stock was needed to make which clocks, and it gives the prices of woods pots for grandfather clocks, for grandmother clocks, more grandmother clocks. And when we get further into the book, we find that he recorded dates. He was very meticulous putting down the, his history. He put down in this book that on November 26, 1969, that he gave blood. Okay, so we come to 1970. In 1970, Foster needed help for his son, Stephen, in caring for the 10 acres of property. It was at this time that Foster hired Robert Joseph Hines, who was in technical school at that time. Thus, Bob Hines began his career as a clockmaker, as the and as the inclement weather and the change of seasons came, he and Stephen began working in the clock shop. He first, this is Bob, apprenticed under Foster, then under both Foster and Elma, and finally just with Elma. Comes January 12, 1973. Elma 
was released from prison having served only three years and ten days of his seven-year term. On December 15, 1973, he married his third wife, Phyllis Means. He was friendly with her husband who passed away. They never had children, but she had three children of her own, Ricky, Freddie, and Ronnie. We move into 1974, mid-year, and we find Foster leaving the employment of Elma Stennis. Foster lived in Weymouth, and when he did that, he turned his garage and his home into a shop for restoring clocks, and he began a life of dealing with clocks, buying and selling clocks. We move now into 1975. So mid-1974 to October 1975, Bob is working directly for Elma Stennis. And it was at that time that Emma <laughs> explained to Bob, who was 19 years old, how his wife felt like a sack of potatoes when he shot her. And Bob has always said to me, can you imagine at 19 years old, I had to listen to that? When we get to October 4th, 1975, that's a Sunday, at about half hour after midnight, two men broke into his home and went to his first floor bedroom where he and Eva were sleeping. And at that time, he was shot to death. And Eva, sorry, and Phyllis took six bullets. She was able to call the 911. She went to the hospital and survived. Elmo was dead. So this day denotes the end of the Elma Osborne Stennis Manufacturing of Clocks. That Sunday, there was a Chapter 8 clock meeting at Norumbega Park, Massachusetts. And when I entered to set up my table, it was a buzz. Everything, everybody was saying, did you hear, did you hear that Elma was no more? At that point, Bob Hines went out on unemployment. Foster had already moved to Pembroke, Massachusetts. And Bob helped Foster set up this clock shop in Pembroke on Scusset Street, where Foster had incorporated his business for clockmaking. And in 1975 and 1976, they made eight cases for Chelsea, three-quarter banjos. They made four cases of Stennis, three-quarter banjos. They made 20 regulator inlay, regular inlaid banjos, three gold front banjos, a Girondo, nine coffin clocks, and a New Hampshire mirror clock. That was their output in 75 over into 76. I would like to say that I never knew Elma Stennis. I joined NAWCC on February 1st, 1969. And in and about that time is when he got out of jail. Sorry, in and about that time is when he was out on bail. And so I got a phone call from the man that had introduced me to NAWCC. His name was Ed Diver. And he said that he and Hans Herman 
another clerk, man, were going down to Stennis's place that evening because Stennis was selling everything in sight to raise money to pay his lawyer. So they invited me to join them. I went there, I went into Elma's shop. I don't believe I had any conversation with Elma. What I remember in my mind is that Hans Hermann, who was a huge man, he converted a pocket watch into a wristwatch from the It was huge. I remember him going out to his car, carrying a number one E. Howard banjo, which is 60 inches long and weighs who knows what, carrying it like a toothpick, putting it in the car. And I know that Ed Divert was after banjo moments, and I think he bought five banjo moments. That is all I really knew of Elmer Stennis. But in the case of Foster Campos, I knew him very well over the 30 years that he was in business between 1975 and December 31st, 2005, when he retired. When he retired, Foster gave everything in his shop to Bob Hines, who we thoroughly enjoyed as a boy and as a man working for him. And Bob, in the workshop that he built for himself with his friends, also in Pembroke, began making clocks under the name of Campos and Hines, Pembroke Mass. And the agreement that they had that he had with Foster, which Foster said to him, the dial will be Campos and Hines, and I assume Bob paid him some sort of royalty, but I don't know, I never asked him. He said, when I'm gone, you don't owe anything to anyone, and you go on with your business. Unfortunately, Foster died in 2007. I had come up from Brazil in the fall of 2005, and when I called Foster, I made arrangements to go down and see him, because I was requesting that he finish the base of a Chelsea ship's belt clock for me. And so I did that, and I told Foster I would be back in the first quarter of 2006 to pick up the base. Everything was fine. When I went back in 2006 and I entered his yard, the clock shop was gone. He had already converted the shop from a cabinet making shop to an apartment. I went into the house, I had a marvelous two hour discussion chat with Foster. And again, I asked him, because I had asked him several times, Foster, what, who killed Elma Stennis? And he always related to me that he thought that it could have been some convicts who Elma had ratted on, because there was something to do with counterfeit money. And he believed that Yes, it could have been Elliot that did it, which is what all the newspapers and, 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 and Phyllis said, but it could have also been some guys in prison. I asked him if he had a banjo. I said, I was thinking of buying a banjo clock. He said, oh, I don't have any. He said, but Bobby is making it. Bobby. Who's Bobby? <laughs> Bobby turns out to be Bob Hines. So we call Bob on the other side of Pembroke. I went to Bob's house, to his shop, and he had banjo cases hanging on the wall. He told me the story of how it began, and I told him I would like to buy a clock. And he offered me number 13. I said, Bob, in Boston, we don't even have hotel floors that are marked 13. There's no way I'm buying a clock with a serial number 13. And I bought serial number 11. And that's how I got to know Bob Hines for the last 
13 years. I believe that Bob Hines is the only living apprentice clockmaker still employed in the manufacturing of clocks in the USA. I further believe that if you were to take your phone and go on Google Maps and drop a pin at downtown Roxbury, downtown crossing Roxbury, and go out on a 40 mile radius and draw a great circle, that you would find within that circle a high 90th percentile of all the clocks that are Simon Willard style weight driven banjo clocks. Here is a reproduction of the movement that Simon Willard patented. This one is made by Kilborn and Proctor Inc. in Waltham, Massachusetts. Once Kilborn and Proctor opened up their business, then there came, became a supply of movements for these clockmakers who were making clocks on the bench. And the reason I talk about the fact that most of the clocks were built within that great circle, Foster Campos bought over 1,100 of these movements, just Foster alone. Elmer, in two years, bought over 350. The only person who bought any quantity other than them was Wayne Klein uh, out in Bowling Green, Kentucky. That concludes my talk. Um, I would like to show you a few things here and two of my Elmer Stennis banjos. We talked about these books. We also have Foster's master book in which he recorded since 1953 the clocks that he made up to, not, not all the way up, but in the early days. For example, here's Lyre clocks up to 1959, 1961, 1960. When he was in the model shop, you know, in those days, you could do, quote unquote, government work. And he had men working for him. And he had patents made for the weight in a liar clock. Here's the patent for the weight in a Girondo clock. And here's the mold that he had made, which you can't see clearly. It has ES in it to make the lead casting for his pendulums. Okay, now let's look at a couple of clocks. Okay. I'm fortunate enough to own the earliest Elmer Stennis banjo clock that Bob and I have ever found. This one is number 50, but it has no date of when it was made. But we know from the picture that I showed you that he was prepared to start making banjo clocks in 1945. We also know from his record book that we have banjo clocks listed with serial numbers of 88 and higher that were made in 1957-58.
So we are assuming that this clock was made sometime between 1945 and 1948. The clock is quite different. It's mahogany with a pine backboard. It, if you took this clock and put it back to back with his later pieces, you would find this one to be slightly smaller in dimensions, particularly across the top of the wasteboard and the bottom of the wasteboard. This one is stamped number 50 on the lower frame of the door. It's stamped inside on the back board number 50 and behind this frame it is also stamped number 50. I believe that the glasses were made by Marianne Picasso. They have a very interesting eyes in this portion of the glass. They are in super condition. This is the tie down that was a standard tie down by Elmer. The bob came from the mold that I just spoke about, and on the back it is showing the E as for Elmer Stennis. The back of the slide on the top is cast with an S. The side arms are cast side arms if you run your fingers in the bottom here and in the top. The dial is hand painted and I believe done by Ed Burke. But we learned, we learned two uh, historical things from this clock. The bezel, which has the S in it for Stennis, came out of the same mold that Bob has. So we think that Alma used that same mold throughout the whole life of his clockmaking. And the bezels were cast, then they had to be drilled and tapped for the clips and screws to hold the glass in. Those were inserted and came out the other side. Then they were turned and smoothed off, so you always had to pay attention to keep the, the units in the right position. And the other thing we learned is Elma made three different styles of snaps to hold the, the bezel. And this is the earliest one on his drawings. The movement is a Howard movement that has the Howard name on it from the period of that time, a number five Howard presentation style movement. And Elma had it modified in the back for mounting by having 632 screw holes drilled in the backboard, in the back plate. And they, they come through from the back of the backboard. Now he sat the movement all the way to the back on the wood. Not common, but he was only beginning. And so there are nine holes in the wood to relieve the screws for the pillar posts and the pivots. And even with that, because of the depth of the case, he had to convex a little bit the dial in order to have the right position for the hour and minute hand post and the winding out of the post. So it's a pretty unique piece to have. There is no indication of the date on this clock. This is my first Elma Stennis clock. I was at the Syracuse New York Regional Meeting in 2010, together with Bob Hines and 
Anthony Weber, Elma's, one of Elma's grandsons. And when looking through the second uh, hall, I came across a clock, this clock, with a three by five card saying it was made by Elma Stentz. And so I looked at it and I thought, gee, this is it's kind of nice. Then I went back to the table and I told Bob, hey, there's an Elma Stennis in the other room. And later after lunch, the fellow that owned it who was a dealer came to Bob because he knew him. He said, hey, I got an Elma Stennis and so and so. And so we went, Bob and I, to the other room. Bob lit up when he saw this car. And he began to teach me about an Elma Stennis car. Look at these glasses, absolutely beautiful. And if you open the door, you see everything Elma Stennis. And if you come down here, which you can't see too clearly, it stamped 35 and six. And it's also stamped 35 on the door, 35 here, and 35 on the dial before it was painted. So it's number 35, or number 36, I may be wrong here, of 1956. Well, according to the record book, Emma Stennis sold 99 cases in 1956 to one of the E. Howard companies who went bust. So knowing him, he bought them back for next to nothing. And this one, he sold to Shreve, Crump, and Lowe, Boston, a very well-known jewelry store. It has a movement which is made from E. Howard Potts, which has his name stamped on the front. And that movement mounts to two brass plates, mounted one on the bottom and one on the top, that are mounted to the back one. Now the purpose of all of this mounting is so that over the years, you don't disturb the wood with wood screws. You can easily mount and dismount the movement for cleaning. It's perhaps one of my most magnificent clocks. Here next to it is an Elma Stennis diamond head banjo dial. And Bob made me this frame that I could conveniently mount it in. I hope that all of you that have watched this have enjoyed what I had to say. And if you are more interested or would like to have further information, please contact NAWCC Chapter 154 to the attention of Randy J, who is the president and who is the guy who has been filming this with me today. Thank you very much. What do you think?